Welcome to the boardroom of the National Transportation Safety Board. I'm Robert Sumwalt. I'm honored to serve as the chairman of the NTSB. And joining us today are my colleagues on the board, Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg, Member Jennifer Homedy. Today we meet in open session as required by the government and the Sunshine Act to consider the left engine failure and subsequent depressurization of Southwest Airlines Flight 1380 while climbing through 32,000 feet, which necessitated an emergency landing at Philadelphia International Airport on April the 17th of last year. A fan blade had fractured at its dovetail in what is called as a fan blade out, or an FBO, event. In the chain of events that resulted, portions of the inlet and fan cowl separated from the airplane, and a fan cowl fragment struck the airplane's fuselage near a cabin window. The window departed the airplane, and the cabin rapidly depressurized. Tragically, one passenger lost her life, and several others received injuries. On behalf of my colleagues on the board and all of us here at the NTSB, we'd like to offer our sincere condolences to the family and friends of the lady who lost her life on board that airplane. And for the, for the others, the occupants of the airplane, even though there may not have been physical injuries, the emotional scars may be there. And we offer our thoughts and prayers for everyone involved in this sad event. The purpose of our discussions today is to learn from what happened so that we can keep it from happening again. The airplane was a Boeing 737-700 and the engine was a CFM-56-7B. When the accident occurred, the NTSB was already investigating an engine failure resulting from an FBO event involving a CFM-56-7B engine on another Southwest Airlines Boeing 737-700 in August of 2016. The earlier event and the event that we're discussing today resulted in a series of inspections from the engine manufacturer, CFM International, and from the Federal Aviation Administration, intended to detect fatigue cracking, which led to the events. But we will go beyond inspections and discuss a lesson discovered as a result of the Philadelphia FBO event. That lesson is the concept of a critical location for an FBO impact on the engine in case. During this FBO event, the fan blade impacted the fan case at a location that was critical to the structural integrity of the fan cowl. This discovery puts manufacturers and aircraft operators in a position to take actions that can ensure the structural integrity of the fan cowl in an FBO event. We also recognize that other airframe and engine combinations might have led to the critical fan blade impact locations, and an impact at those loca locations could affect nacelle components, including the inlet and fan cowl. And although not a factor in this accident outcome, we will discuss the flight crew's performance during the emergency including the decision of the crew to land at Philadelphia. In today's board meeting, the staff will lay out the pertinent facts and analysis found in the draft report. They will present the findings, the probable cause, and recommendations to the board. We on the board will then question the staff. We'll deliberate and vote on any proposed amendments to ensure that the report that we adopt today truly provides the best opportunity to enhance safety. On November the 14th of last year, the NTSB held an investigative hearing to discuss this, this accident, and all of the exhibits from that hearing are available on our website at ntsb.gov. The public docket for today's board meeting, also available on our website, contains more than 1,300 pages of additional information including photos and post-accident interviews. Once finalized, 
in about three to four weeks, the final report from today's board meeting will actually be published and available on our website. Now, Managing Director Sharon Bryson, good morning. If you'll kindly introduce the staff. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A few announcements to the audience before we begin. I'd kindly request that you, if you have not already done so, please silence your mobile phones and other electronic devices. There are two exits from the boardroom. Here at the front of the auditorium, you can see um, on either side of the dais. Um, go down the stairs and through the door. This will take you into the hallways of the lower level of the office building before you depart the facility. The other exit would be the way that you entered the boardroom, walk up the aisle, out the glass doors that you entered, out the stairs, and exit through the large glass doors to the outside. Once you've exited, turn left and follow the sidewalk to the end of the street. NTSB staff and the security personnel will direct you in the event of an emergency. We'll also direct you when it's safe to return to the boardroom. And should one be needed, there is also an AED device in the lobby of the boardroom. Um, and security personnel can contact 911 if needed. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to speak with anyone on the NTSB staff. Thank you. Seated at the panel this morning with me, unless otherwise noted, are staff members from the Office of Aviation Safety. On the first row, starting to my right, is Mr. Tim LeBaron, who is the Deputy Director in the Office of Aviation Safety. To his right is Bill English, the investigator in charge for this accident. To his right is Pierre Scarfo, who handles power plants. Next to him is Dr. Matt Fox, metallurgy. He is from the Office of Research and Engineering. Brian Murphy at the end of this row um, handles structures. Behind, seated directly behind me is Darlene Hatchett. She's the director of the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. To Darlene's right is Kathleen Silba, our general counsel. To her right is Jim Ritter, the director of the Office of Research and Engineering. To Jim's right is Karen Stein, the report writer for this report. To her right is Jason Fedak, survival factors. To his right is Captain Marvin France, operational factors. Seated in the very last row, is Andy Olbis, air traffic control, and he's handling our visuals and timing for today. Next to him is Greg Bursari, who handles maintenance records. Joe Greger, cockpit voice recorder from our Office of Research and Engineering. Charles Cates, also from flight data, handling the flight data recorder, also from the Office of Research and Engineering. And Nathan Hoyt from our Office of Safety Recommendations handling uh, aviation recommendations. The presentations will begin with an overview by the investigator in charge, Mr. Bill English. Thank you, Ms. Bryson, and thank you, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. On April 17, 2018, at 11.03 Eastern Daylight Time, Southwest Airlines Flight 1380 a 737-700, experienced a failure of the left engine, a CFM 56-7B, and partial loss of the engine inlet and fan cowl during climb. Fragments from the engine inlet and fan cowl struck the wing and fuselage, resulting in a depressurization due to the departure of one passenger window. The flight crew conducted an emergency descent and diverted into Philadelphia International Airport. Of the 144 passengers and five crew members aboard, one passenger received fatal injuries, and eight passengers received minor injuries. The initial climb was normal, weather was good, when the crew reported that passing through 32,600 feet, they heard a loud sound and numerous alarms indicating a failure of the left engine. A cabin altitude alarm sounded, indicating a depressurization of the airplane. The airplane rolled left about 41 degrees before the crew was able to level the wings. They donned oxygen masks and began an emergency descent. ATC advised that Harrisburg Airport was the nearest. The crew decided to divert to Philadelphia, which was equal flying time and had better emergency services available. The flight crew secured the failed engine within 36 seconds. They experienced difficulty controlling the airplane 
severe vibration, and noise as they initially focused on basic control and executing an emergency descent. The crew initiated relevant emergency checklists, and although they did not complete all of the items as prescribed, with limited time and numerous complicating factors, they coordinated with each other and none of the admitted steps affected the outcome. As the flight diverted to Philadelphia, it was evident that the left engine suffered severe damage. The inlet had completely separated from the engine except for portions of the containment shield and other small pieces. The majority of the inboard fan cowl was distorted, twisted, and flattened while almost the entire outboard fan cowl was missing. A portion of the fan cowl and latch mechanism struck the fuselage near the window adjacent to row 14. The impact resulted in the window departing the airplane, causing a rapid depressurization of the cabin, and the partial ejection and fatal injury to the passenger in seat 14A. The sides of the fuselage, including window areas, are not designed to withstand impact. The cabin crew, with the assistance of passengers, brought the injured passenger back in and initiated first aid. Some passengers were reseated to accommodate the efforts. As the airplane approached Philadelphia, none of the flight attendants were secured in their jump seats. Mr. Fedock will discuss the cabin safety issues from this event in his presentation. The investigation found one of the left engine fan blades separated at the root due to a fatigue crack. Dr. Fox will have details of the metallurgical findings and the history of cracking in this type of fan blade in his presentation. At the time of failure, the blade tip struck the engine fan case, resulting in a large impact load to the engine case and the fragmentation of the blade into several pieces. Portions of the fragmented blade were ejected forward into the inlet. There was significant damage to the inlet and fan cowl that was unexpected for a fan blade out event. Mr. Scarfo will discuss the details of the fan blade out event in his presentation. The Boeing 737-700 engine nacelle is flattened on the bottom to accommodate ground clearance. The fan blade initially contacted the fan case near the six o'clock or bottom position adjacent to the flattened area. A component called the radial restraint fitting, which helps hold the shape of the cowl, allowed loads to travel from the fan case into the cowl, causing fractures and latch disengagement, followed by the separating of portions of the fan cowl latch, which traveled over the wing and impacted the fuselage near the window at row 14. Mr. Murphy will have details of the nacelle damage in his presentation. Safety issues examined in this report include the structural integrity of the fan cowl after FBO events, determining the critical fan blade impact locations and their effect on the cell components, the importance of having flight attendants secured, and guidance on the reseating of passengers during a loss of seating capacity. Staff has proposed recommendations in these areas. We would like to thank the parties to the investigation for their assistance as well as the NX-13 accredited representative and technical advisors, which are listed here. I would also like to acknowledge all of the NTSB staff and Chairman Sumwalt, who was the board member on scene. Mr. Scarfo and Dr. Fox will now discuss details of the fan blade separation. The accident airplane was equipped with two CFM-56-7B turbofan engines. <clears throat> This figure depicts the engine fan section, as well as inlet and fan cowl, which are part of the nacelle and their relationship to one another. These areas will be discussed in detail during the course of the power plant, metallurgical, and structures presentations. The left engine experienced a fan blade fracture. The subsequent full-length fan blade release is commonly referred to as an FBO event, or fan blade out, or FBO event. On scene examination, the failed fan blade dovetail, while it was still installed in the fan disc, showed metal fatigue. The released fan blade created multiple impact marks, gouges, and tears around the circumference of the fan case. There was no evidence of any of the fan blade fragments passing through it, thus the fan case performed as intended for an FBO event. With the fan blades removed, blade fragment exit trajectories, highlighted by the different colored tape, 
were projected based on impact marks found in the fan case and inlet. The fan blade tip was estimated to have spiraled out of the, out of the engine, crossing the A1 flange at an angle between 15 and 30 degrees. All the fan blades were manufactured in 2000, entered into service in 2001, and remained together as a complete set throughout their service life. At the time of the accident, the fan blade set had accumulated 32,636 flight cycles. The fan blade set was overhauled twice. At each overhaul, the fan blade set was visually inspected for damage, and a fluorescent penetrant inspection, referred to as FPI, was performed to detect cracks per the engine manual. No cracks were found. At the time of the accident, CFM recommended that fan blade dovetails be relubed no later than every 3,000 flight cycles. Based on all the relubes performed after the November 2012 overhaul, the fan blade set, on average, was relubed every 1,500 flight cycles, and none exceeded the 3,000 flight cycle recommendation limit. Dr. Fox now will, will now discuss the metallurgical findings for the fan blade hardware. The initial fracture occurred in the dovetail of fan blade number 13 near the edge of the contact face, which is an area of high stress on the blade. To help prevent wear and to reduce contact stresses, the dovetail contact faces are covered with a relatively compliant coating during manufacturing and after each blade overhaul. Additionally, shims are installed on the dovetail with lubrication applied to the contact faces before first installation, after overhaul, and during each blade relubrication. The separated portion of the fan blade impacted the engine fan case and fractured into multiple fragments. The recovered portions of the fan blade, representing approximately 75% of the original blade, are shown in the left image. And the dovetail portion, shown at the right, was recovered from the slot in, it, in the fan disc. The blade fracture occurred due to a low cycle fatigue crack that initiated on the convex side of the dovetail near the leading edge. The remaining 23 blades from the accident engine were inspected using multiple non-destructive inspection methods and no additional cracks were detected. A similar fan blade fracture occurred in August 2016 in another CFM 56-7B engine during a Southwest Airlines, Airlines flight that landed safely in Pensacola, Florida. In response to fatigue cracks found in fan blades from that accident, CFM re-evaluated the dovetail stresses and determined <coughs> fatigue cracks initiated because the dovetail was experiencing peak stresses that were higher than originally predicted. CFM found that the higher stresses in the dovetail could occur under normal engine operating conditions due to issues including dovetail coating damage and thickness variations, higher levels of pressure face contact friction and edge loading than expected, and loss or relaxation of compressive residual stress. The fractured blade from this accident was examined using a scanning electron microscope to estimate the total number of fatigue striations that were present on the fracture surface. Each striation represents an increment of crack growth from a single load cycle, which in this case was a flight cycle. Based on the fractographic findings and maintenance records, the estimated total flight cycles associated with crack growth was 20,000 cycles. Maintenance records showed that the blade had been overhauled 10,712 flight cycles before the accident which means the blade was likely cracked at the time of last overhaul. As mentioned earlier, fluorescent penetrant inspection was used to inspect for cracks in the blade overhaul. Additionally, visual inspections were conducting, conducted during each of seven blade relubrications that occurred since overhaul. It is likely the crack was not detectable by the fluorescent penetrant inspection conducted at the time of fan, the fan blade set's last overhaul or by the subsequent visual inspections conducted at the time of fan blade relubrications. 
Mr. Scarfo will now continue with corrective actions taken by CFM and regulators to address this issue. After the 2016 Pensacola FBO event, CFM developed two additional non-destructive inspection requirements to detect for fan blade dovetail cracks. An eddy current inspection, referred to as ECI, and an ultrasonic test, referred to as UT. Although these inspection techniques are well established, CFM had developed specialized probes for each method to match the unique contours of the fan blade dovetail. For each method, the entire length of the dovetail is scanned on both sides. For this specific application, ECI and UT provides a higher probability of detection than the FPI used during the previous overhauls. The fan blade dovetail is removed during overhaul, exposing, exposing a clean surface. In this condition, the use of ECI is an effective method for detecting surface and, sub and near surface cracks. However, for the on-wing inspection, the dovetail coating is present, making ECI not well suited. Instead, for this application, UT was used. UT is an ideal method for detecting surface and subsurface anomalies. Since the introduction of the first on-wing inspection service bulletin issued in March of 2017, CFM has issued two additional service bulletins with multiple revisions varying the initial and repetitive inspection intervals based on fleet inspection results. The FAA and EASA have issued a combined total of eight separate airworthiness directives mandating the different on-wing inspection requirements. In addition to the new inspections, CFM reduced the fan blade dovetail reloop from, from 3,000 to 1,600 flight cycles. During the reloop task, only high-cycled fan blades are required to be UT inspected. However, according to Southwest Airlines, UT is performed at every reloop, no matter the flight cycles. Utilizing ECI and UT, 15 additional fan blades from multiple operators were positively confirmed to be cracked and have been removed from service. Including this and the Pensacola accidents, the total number of failed or cracked fan blades is 23. This completes the power plant and metallurgical presentations. Mr. Murphy will now present the structure's findings. Thank you, Mr. Scarfo. <clears throat> This morning, I'll be discussing the failure of the nacelle, inlet, and fan cowl structures. The inlet is an aerodynamic fairing which directs the airflow to the fan and core sections of the engine as shown on the left and highlighted in yellow, and it is attached to the engine fan case. A representative cross-section of the inlet is shown to the right. This morning, I will be focusing on the inlet inner barrel and the containment shield. The investigation revealed that portions of the fan blade traveled forward of the containment shield, causing substantial damage to the inlet inner barrel. This damage was not accounted for during the original analysis because it was not observed during the component testing or the certification test. An additional source of damage to the inlet was due to the displacement wave that traveled circumferentially around the engine fan case. The engine deflections that occur as a result of the engine fan case absorbing the impact energy of a released blade are referred to as the displacement wave. Those deflections and associated stresses cause additional local, additional local damage to the inlet. The structural analysis determined that the inlet departed the airplane within half of a second following the fan blade out due to fragments entering the inlet forward of the containment shield differently than observed during certification, along with the damage caused by the displacement wave. The fan cowl is comprised of inboard and outboard halves, enclosing the engine fan case as shown on the left and highlighted in yellow. It serves as an aerodynamic fairing extending from the aft edge of the inlet to the forward edge of the thrust reverser. As shown on the right, the inboard and outboard fan cowls are hinged at the top to allow opening for maintenance. At the bottom, the two halves are connected by three latch assemblies and the radial restraint fitting assembly attaches the inboard fan cowl to the engine fan case and maintains the asymmetrical shape. Concurrent with the inlet damage, 
the fan blade's impact with the fan case also initiated damage in the fan cowl structure. During the preliminary design of the fan cowl, the predicted loads for the radial restraint fitting following a fan blade out were extremely high, and it was assumed the fitting would fail immediately following the fan blade out, and it was thus omitted from the analysis. However, during the accident, the radial restraint fitting, as shown on the left, did not immediately fail. And unlike what was assumed during certification, the impact loads from the fan blade out were transferred from the engine fan case to the fan cowl structure, through the radial restraint fitting assembly, causing cracks to initiate and grow throughout the inboard fan cowl structure within 28 milliseconds following the fan blade out, as shown on the right. The subsequent rundown and external aerodynamic pressure loads resulted in further crack propagation and failure of the inboard fan cowl skin panel and latch assemblies, allowing the fan cowls to become disengaged and open. As a result, portions of the fan cowl deported, departed the airplane and struck the fuselage following the fan blade out, causing the loss of a passenger window and the cabin depressurization in less than one-tenth of a second. In summary, safety would be improved if Boeing and the certification authorities implemented design changes to ensure the structural integrity of the fan cowl on the Boeing 737 Next Generation series of airplanes after a fan blade out, determining whether other airframe and engine combinations have any critical fan blade impact locations and how an impact at those locations could affect nacelle structure, and finally, by investigating the structural integrity of the nacelle structure for a fan blade out during all engine operating design conditions. Mr. Fedok will now discuss the survival factors issues related to the accident. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Flight 1380 was a full flight with 143 passengers seated in the cabin. There were three flight attendants designated A, B, and C. Flight attendants A and C were assigned to the forward dual position jump seat shown in green here on the right. Flight attendant B was assigned to the aft dual position jump seat where she sat for takeoff with a non-revenue company employee who was not a flight attendant. After the depressurization, all three flight attendants returned to their assigned jump seats, donned oxygen masks, and later retrieved portable oxygen bottles to move into the cabin to check on passengers. When flight attendant C reached row 14, she saw a passenger, whose seatbelt was still buckled, had been partially pulled outside the airplane through the window. Flight attendants A and C tried to bring the passenger back into the airplane, but were unable to do so. Two passengers were eventually able to pull the passenger back into the airplane so medically qualified passengers could begin resuscitation efforts. About five and a half minutes before landing, the first officer contacted flight attendant C on the interphone. She told him about the injured passenger and the first officer stated, we're gonna land as soon as we can. The flight attendants then advised the passengers, we are almost landing and about one minute later, we are almost there. During the 19 seconds prior to touchdown, the flight attendants shouted brace commands to passengers. For landing, flight attendant A sat on the floor in the aisle near row four or five while passengers held her down. Flight attendants B and C sat on the floor in the aft galley while a displaced passenger from row 14 and the non-revenue company employee sat on the aft flight attendant jump seat. The dual position jump seat in the forward galley was unoccupied during landing. The flight attendants' decisions to sit on the floor were contrary to guidance in the company's flight attendant manual that flight attendants needed to be seated in their assigned jump seats with their restraints fastened for every takeoff and landing. The manual also stated that during a planned emergency landing, flight attendants were required to occupy their jump seats in order to be prepared for a possible evacuation after landing. Staff recognizes that the emergency descent was challenging for all of the crew members because of the conditions inside the airplane. However, being fully prepared for an evacuation is a flight attendant's most critical responsibility in an emergency situation. Although not a factor in the outcome of this accident, the flight attendants should have been properly restrained in their assigned jump seats for landing. This flight was full with no open passenger seats remaining and the flight attendants needed to reseat the two passengers from row 14 so that the injured passenger could receive medical care. 
The displaced passengers went to the aft galley. One sat on the aft flight attendant jump seat, and the other sat on the floor for landing. The Southwest Airlines flight attendant manual and training did not address a situation in which no additional seats were available for reseating passengers. Similarly, a review of FAA regulations and guidance materials did not identify any specific guidance for this situation. Guidance addressing options for reseating passengers during an in-flight loss of seating capacity would help air carriers implement procedures to address this situation. In summary, staff has proposed two recommendations to address the cabin safety issues in this accident. Safety would be improved by Southwest Airlines flight attendants reviewing the lessons learned from this accident and training. Safety would also be improved by the FAA developing guidance to mitigate hazards to passengers affected by an in-flight loss of seating capacity. This concludes staff's presentations. Thank you very much for those uh, presentations. We'll now turn to the board member questions. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank uh, the staff for a most comprehensive report. Approximately how many CFM 56-7B engines are there in service worldwide? Uh, approximately 14,600, give or take. How many blades does that equate to? Any uh, Approximately 356,000. That's a lot of blades. Um, how many fan blade out failures have there been? For the uh, CFM 56-7B, the only two full fan blade out events are the one in Pensacola and the investigation that we're working on right now. Uh, there have been two other partial fan blade tip events uh, due to ingestion events, but those would not be categorized as true FBO events. So would it be fair to characterize this as highly unusual? Absolutely. And these engines have been in service since when? Uh, the engine was certificated in 1996, and the airframe was certificated in 1997. OK. What was different about this fan blade out event um, in the Philadelphia event and the one that uh, we were investigating uh, where the aircraft landed in Pensacola with no injury? Um, there were several different uh, aspects to that investigation. One was the, the uh, fan blade impact location in uh, Pensacola. It was roughly between the three and four o'clock position for, for Philadelphia, it was at the six o'clock position. In Pensacola, we lost the entire blade. Uh, that in, in the um, Philadelphia event, we, we uh, retained the blade uh, root and mid-span. We only lost parts of the mid-span and tip. Um, during all the certification and rig tests, we've never lost an entire blade going forward, so that made uh, Pensacola quite unique. Um, the inlet departed for Pensacola towards the, uh, towards the fuselage. That's what caused the depressurization in that event. It, um, it departed outboard for, for Philadelphia, and the, uh, the other major difference was in uh, Pensacola, we retained the fan cowls, and for Philly, we did not. Could you describe um, what happens when there is a rapid depressurization inside the cabin? I'm, I've sat through many of the briefings um, and also had some high altitude um, training in altitude chambers, and it seems a little bit different than what, what is briefed by the airlines. Conditions in the cabin will get windy, uh, foggy, and there'll be likely debris flying about. So it's not quite as benign as the oxygen masks will come down from the ceiling, you know, put on your mask first and tighten and, and so on. There's likely to be a lot more uh, confusion and the temperature drop, um, temperature outside at those altitudes is probably in the neighborhood of 30 to 50 below zero. Is that correct? Uh, it sounds accurate, yes. So it, 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 what we're dealing with is a really chaotic situation. Uh, fair statement? Uh, initially, yes. Conditions in the cabins change dramatically. OK. Um, I've got some more complicated questions to ask, so I'll uh, yield the rest of my time. Great. Thanks. Uh, Member Hamadi. Thank you. Um, 
what are the FAA requirements for develop and certi development and certification of the engine and airframe with respect to fan blade out events? As far as the engine is concerned, uh, there's two major regulations that uh, do with fan blade containment. In essence, what they're telling us is that um, for protection of the aircraft, you don't want any uh, a, any fan blade or, or basically any fan blade material to go through the fan case. Uh, so you want radial containment. And for those particles or fragments that you cannot contain, uh, you need to provide extra trajectories and energies so that the airframe um, manufacturer can develop uh, a, a secondary type of uh, containment uh, protocol to, uh, to make sure that the uh, airplane is uh, safe to fly. And during development and certification of the engine, eight fan blade out rig tests and two engine fan blade out containment certification tests were conducted. Can you describe how those tests are conducted and uh, what the purpose of the tests are? Um, the Prior to a certification test, there's multiple rig tests, and those are essentially component-type testing where you're, you're uh, testing a particular feature, whether it's the fan case, the axial retention of the blades, blade interaction. You want to understand the loads, uh, the, the way the fan blade uh, fragments and its uh, trajectories. So you like to have all that before you do a, a full-up uh, certification test or a full-up rig test. So when you get to the point of um, you, you think you've got all your ducks in a row, then that's when you go ahead and you do a, um, a uh, what they did was a, a rig four test, which was the first test prior to certification that had production representative hardware. Uh, prior to that, it was pretty much just development hardware. Well, and can you, and I, I always try to keep in mind that there may be people watching who are not familiar with terminology that we use uh, or this event. Can you describe what a rig test is? A, a rig test is essentially a component test. So it will not be a full engine and maybe a set of blades. It may not be the entire set of blades. Um, it'll have uh, developmental hardware like the, the, the fan case or anything that they want to go ahead and, and, and test. So it's, okay. it's a very specialized test, not the whole engine. And uh, this may be for Mr. Murphy, I'm not sure, but was an inlet installed during any of the tests, and is that a requirement in the regulations? Uh, I believe for the, uh, the first certification test, yes, there was an inlet installed. What, um, I think it was one rig and was one certification one test, right? One rig, one rig as yeah. well, but they do not have to be the production hardware. They, they need to match... Uh, other characteristics, uh, the, the mass, uh, the weight, the center of gravity, uh, those the stiffness, those types of things are required. Um, the so Part like 25 airframe world not. does not have a requirement that they have to test an inlet or a fan cowl on an engine test. It's an engine. This is a Part 33 engine test, not an airframe certification test. Right. So with respect to the inlet, were there any aspects of the Philadelphia accident that were consistent with the tests that were conducted as part of the engine and airplane, airplane certific airframe certifications? And were there any significant differences? Uh, the significant difference is during the rig tests, the rig test four that you mentioned, and the certification test, we never lost the inlet. Um, in one case, we had considerable damage to the inlet, but that was due to additional blades that were released. But as far as the, 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 the test protocol of containing the initial fan blade release, uh, the inlet stayed on and wasn't penetrated during the, the, during the uh, certification tests. Okay. I have additional questions on the fan cowl, which may, I'm definitely going to go over my 40 seconds, so I'll wait and yield to you. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. LeBaron, um, as you know, the ICAO Annex 13 uh, says that the state conducting the investigation shall make the final report publicly available as soon as possible and, if possible, within 12 months. Now, here we are 19 months after the event. Uh, I understand that investigations take a while, but just so the public can understand what uh, challenges might you have encountered to cause this report, this report to, uh, 
to go on for this long. So this, <clears throat> this particular investigation, uh, uh, as you know, uh, there was a lot of technical stuff that we had to figure out. Uh, when you realize that, okay, we know that we had a fan blade come out, well, what happened? And so um, this was a very technical investigation, and that's why it took longer than, than normal. Thank you very much. And you held a public hearing last year. Um, so anyway, thank you. You know, what, what is impressive is that I was there on the ground with, uh, with many of you uh, that afternoon in Philadelphia. It was a cold, windy day, and Mr. Scarfo and Mr. Murphy stuck your head in the engine inlet, and uh, within a matter of seconds, you had identified and could, could point out the fatigue fracture. And that evening when we did a press conference, we could report to the public that it was fatigue. So it's, uh, it's uh, gratifying to watch our professionals work and do the work that you do. So thank you for that. So Mr. Scarfo, um, uh, I heard a reporter a few weeks ago uh, ask me about the uncontained engine failure. But technically, this is not an uncontained engine failure. Uh, isn't, is that correct? Because that is, that the, is correct. Yeah, because the, the component, the fan blade itself, did stay, it was, it was contained. It did not breach the, uh, the containment case. None of the cases uh, were breached, so that's, uh, that's what's considered uh, whether it's contained or not contained. So the, the, this blade did not perform as CFM and probably Boeing had, uh, had, in, had intended. The, I think that the, in certification tests, they expected the blade to move forward in a, in a, in a, in a direction, um, a, a helical, helical, helical direction about 15 degrees max. Is that correct? Whereas yeah. this one moved forward about, what, between 20 and 30 degrees? Um, the, the design requirements for the inlet were for a fan blade uh, traveling across the A flange, A1 flange, at, at 15 degrees. Um, based on all the um, damage and scrape marks from the fan case and inlet, uh, it was uh, decided that the fan blade crossed over that uh, same flange between 15 and 30 degrees. So it was outside of what? what was anticipated from the certification test. It had traveled beyond what was, uh, which was documented during the rig and uh, certification test, yes. Did it travel forward of what's called the containment doubler? Uh, yes, it did. Yes. So as I understand it, in, in the certification test, they had the blade coming out at the 12 o'clock position. That is correct. And they figured that that was the most critical position because there it had the potential to come up, cause damage to the pylon and possibly the wing. I believe the 12 o'clock position is an arbitrary position. If you canvas different um, engine manufacturers, they may have different release points. And it's typically usually a, a function of the um, test facility where you point cameras and, and lighting. So there, there are no uh, regulations or guidance from the FA on where you, where you do the release point. In this case, we found that it was, it was critical because it, 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 it impacted the fan case at the six o'clock position, which then, as pointed out in your presentation, transmitted the loads through the radial restraint fitting that put it down into the fan cowl itself. That is correct. And, and just for clarity, when they do the certification test, the fan cowls are or not installed, so that's not something you would uh, necessarily have, have noted during the certification test. Great, thank you. Vice Chairman. Um, we seem to be focusing a lot on certification, so um, in following along with my colleagues here, what have Boeing and GE uh, Saffron done since these two uh, accidents uh, to reduce the probability uh, of a repeat? As, as as far as the, uh, the engine is concerned, uh, there's been, as I presented, new uh, inspection techniques. So during overhaul, you have the ECI, and during on wing, you have the UT. So the, the essence is to catch these cracks before they develop to the point uh, of, of fracture. 
So no change then in the testing procedure for future engines uh, in terms of, um, you know, as we said here, you know, this was not an uncontained engine failure. The, the blade was contained, but unfortunately the cowling was not. And so the end result was exactly the same. So I'm just curious if, if there's been any discussion or, or direction about how we conduct the testing that uh, ensures the integrity, I guess, of, of the cowl as well. I think there's been discussions on analyzing uh, a fan blade out event at different speeds, if that uh, presents a, a different challenge to the, not only to the case, but to the, to the airframe structure. Uh, currently, the FAA has a mechanism in place so that if, so that if uh, new technology is introduced or the current regulations for that technology aren't ac adequate, uh, the FAA can um, have a special condition. Special condition uh, provides uh, additional guidance on how either testing or the analysis of that data occurs. So. Yep. Do I understand correctly that uh, the uh, CFR Part 33 has not changed since 1984? Uh, that is correct. Essentially, even though the engines are getting bigger and more powerful, uh, the requirements are essentially the same. Does it seem like uh, we've learned something here that might uh, indicate that uh, those rules perhaps should be looked at again? From the, from the engine standpoint, I think um, uh, the regulations as is, other than maybe having uh, further analysis on different uh, um, release points and different uh, rotor speeds, but essentially the regulations are for demonstrating the capability of radial containment. So uh, as the chairman has pointed out, um, you know, initially it was thought, well, the 12 o'clock position would be bad or the worst case scenario, or it was based on how they had the test rig set up. Is that correct? That is correct. And so this blade exited at the 6 to 6.30 position where it caused it to impact the cowl uh, latch. Is that correct? Uh, it, it impacted the fan case, mm -hmm. and those loads got transmitted down to the, uh, to the fan cowl. understand. It almost seems like in order to get proper testing here, I'm showing my ignorance here, but uh, um, you've got 360 degrees of possibility. Um, how do we address that? Or can we say with some degree of certainty that there are certain areas that are absolutely more critical than, than others? Uh, the, the one thing that we have to realize is that the, the containment test is a PAR 33 test. It's really an engine test. It's not an airframe test. And it's really to demonstrate the radial capability uh, of the fan case. And if fragments do eject forward, that those uh, energies and trajectories get uh, accounted for and provided to the airframer. So it's, it's really not a, a, an airframe test. It's not required that airframe parts have to be on it. It's always good to have that. But it's not a requirement. So um, what, what, they, what the airframer would have to do is a lot of this has to be done by analysis. Once the loads are provided to them, they would have to analyze those loads at different uh, impact locations. Is that being done? Yeah, as, as far as uh, the airframe uh, side, even for this aircraft, it was done at every, the blades were released at every 30 minutes, I believe, going around the clock. So analytically, yes, the fan cowl and the inlet were looked at at every 30 minutes going around the clock, rather. 30 analytically, minutes. but not in real, no, I, I realize in, that's expensive to do, but. Uh, um, no, but the, the, the test, the information gained from the test, whether it be the deflections, uh, strain gauges, or measured deflections, then are used in hand with the analysis in order to correlate and validate your analytical tool based on a known test data point, or, and then go forward from there and say, okay, I am smart enough to use the analytical tool because I matched this actual test condition. So then I can go forward based on that and every 30 minutes, as I believe that was done on the NG for this engine, they released the blade at every 30 minutes. Great, hold that thought, we'll get back to it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chairman.
Member Hamadi. Was that done originally as part of the modeling and the testing, or you're talking about after this event? No, that was done during the initial certification. It was looked at at every 30 minutes, a blade okay. release at every 30 minutes. On and the at different RPMs or just max RPM? No, for this, as far as, there were different fuel configurations, uh, but no, not for different engine speeds. It was done for what the test was, which was a maximum max. RPM. So that was what was correlated to, to say we could go forward with and that. And max would typically be at takeoff, not in cruise, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So um, how, and we mentioned this in the report because a fan cowl is not required to be uh, used during the certification, during the testing, and that's so they can see how the engine performs, correct? And so Boeing then took what, what was learned from the rig tests and the certification tests, and then they did modeling with this Nastran, am I saying that right? Nastran. Na Nastran. Nastran finite element model. Can you describe how that works? Uh, in English. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm an engineer, so my English right. isn't that okay. good. So, um, but it's basically a mathematical simulation of the structure. You have your stiffnesses of the structure. You've modeled, you know, the table here as best you can, and it performs, it deflects, it all just like an actual airplane would. And for a long, long time now, we've been using finite element codes to design and analyze airplanes. And you, you match your deflections, you match your strains, you correlate back to test data, and you say, yes, I can use this tool because I'm smart enough and I have said, uh, you know, we, you don't want to do the one thing we never want to do. We call it in the industry, pardon me, but garbage in, garbage out. So you have to always go and correlate your fancy tool, your analytical tool, back to some known test data to say, I can use this and I'm doing it right. Great, so in, as a result of that modeling, there were some conclusions or assumptions that uh, were derived on how loads would be transferred to the radio restraint fitting, correct? Yes. And first, can you describe for people who aren't familiar with this, why did they need the radial restraint fitting? The radial restraint fitting was just there because of the you know, the, the shape, the engine and the landing gear configuration, and they had to get a flat bottom. Because it was uh, a large cell. diameter engine, right? And they, had to, they needed the flat bottom, so in order to keep it latched and closed at the bottom and keep it in a, that shape, that's the only reason it was put there. Okay, so what were the, what, what did Boeing assume or derive from the testing on the radial restraint fitting? There wasn't any testing on the radial restraint Not, fitting. There was the analysis on the radial restraint fitting. The analysis, right, sorry. The analysis, the analysis concluded that when a fan blade was released, some portion of that radial restraint fitting, whether it was on the engine case side or the cowl side or the clips that actually attached to the frames, the stresses were going to exceed what that part was capable of doing. So I believe in that analysis, the, Radial restraint training was modeled with springs, so they pull the loads out of those springs, then go back and to the old school way with a pen and a piece of paper and the, the tools we've learned in all of our textbooks and sized some of all the parts and determined that for a fan blade out, that part is actually going to fail. So they said, okay, fine, we'll just remove it from the analysis, we'll omit it from the analysis and design all the other structure so that it can carry the loads. And stay intact. And stay intact. The, right. the problem is when you go back to that time frame in 1990-ish, uh, you know, we didn't have the capability to see things down at 28 milliseconds. Well, and that's, that's actually why I'm asking all of these questions. Two, two questions before my time, time is up. Could Boeing have known during their original testing and modeling in the 90s that this was we state they use the state of the art technology at the time. Should this have been known? I, I do not believe so. I concur with what I found when doing okay. the investigation and would have done it the same way if I was sitting in so, the chair that day. Understood, and, the, and we state that in the report. So here's my question. How 
do, how does industry then keep up with technology advances? Because we could have, you could do testing and certification on something today, and in five, 10 years down the road, you have new technology that may be able to determine safety deficiencies in what you previously tested and we were able to prove some sort of performance. So I'm just wondering, we don't have a process where they have to go back and do certification and t testing and all this don't. modeling, but then how does industry then stay ahead of the game with all the technology advances? We we don't, we don't go backwards um, unless we have an event such as this. Then we take today's tools and we put them to use on an event like this. As the industry is going forward and as the tools become available, they start to be used in the new certification programs. In this area on, I think, to the two newest programs at Boeing, in this area, they are using the, these newer tools um, that's not to say that you need to use those in every part of the airplane. I mean, the old tried and true methods are still standing true. Um, when, when you have a case like this and you have lessons learned, you say, okay, now we're going to go back and we're going to look at our two other airframes that are currently in production and we're going to make sure we don't have this same issue arise. And, and they have done that. Thank you, Member Hamadi. Um, Dr. Fox, um, did we find any material defect in this in this fan blade? I know about almost two years ago we we did an investigation of a of a CF6 engine and the I think the low low pressure turbine that had dirty white spots, for example. Did we find any material defects here at all? We we looked at the materials and there were no anomalies or defects. Thank you very much. So, um, as the vice chairman said, uh, uh, Mr. Scarfo, this uh, this engine has uh, this this engine type CFM 56-7B has nearly there are nearly 15,000 in in service, 400 million flight hours fleet wide, 200 million cycles. There have been two FBO events full FBO events, both have been on Southwest Airlines airplanes. Is that correct? That is correct. Of the 23 fleet-wide cracks that have been identified, how many of those have been on Southwest airplanes? That's a good question. I'm not exactly sure I have the exact number. They are the, the fleet leader. Um, they have the majority of the 23. Uh, the Pensacola event had quite a few. The Philly event had one. And then there's been a few that are found during service. But I don't have the exact number yeah. of the 23. Yeah, I was told yesterday by Southwest that it's around 16 that they've had, 16. So is there anything that staff has found? They're the only organization that's had two FBO events and they've had the majority of the cracks. Is there anything that staff has found in your investigation that, that, that may be related to Southwest Airlines and the, and the uh, overrepresented number of uh, uh, fan blade cracks or FBOs? We have found nothing that's unique to Southwest to account for them having those two events, whether it's maintenance or operational. Okay, thank you. So um, the fan blade, this fan blade set was uh, overhauled in October of 2012, and at that point, um, the it since then has accumulated about seven about 10,712 cycles. Why was the crack? Okay, but we know this crack originated about 20,000 cycles ago. That was the initiation of the cycle of the of the crack. So therefore, if it's had ten thousand, almost eleven thousand cycles since then, as you said in your presentation, this pretty much means that the crack was prior to its last shop visit, its last overhaul. Why was that? Why was this crack not detected by FPI? 
Well, any um, non-destructive inspection technique is going to have a probability of detection for any crack of any given size. Um, and that goes for the FPI inspection that was uh, in effect at the time the blade was overhauled. Um, so there's lots of reasons why, you know, potential reasons why a crack might not be detected using that technique. Um, you know, it, it certainly if the crack's too small um, for the, the technique. Um, but if these, the other issues can be surface condition. Uh, you know, this particular, uh, this blade has a compressive residual stress applied on its uh, surface that helps with the fatigue life but it also makes it more difficult and challenging for uh, some uh, techniques such as FPI to detect cracks. Um, so, so there's uh, a lot of, and then you got the visual inspections as well that uh, you, know, it, you have even lower probability for a given crack size. All right, so let's talk about the visual uh, inspection. So this dovetail was re-lubricated re seven times. So that's seven visual inspection opportunities. It was not caught there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's correct. And, and, the, and why was it not, not detected? Um, well, the, uh, the crack is very close to the, uh, the coating, the dovetail coating, so that makes it more difficult to detect. And in some cases, in the Pensacola case, it was actually under the coating. So there was, uh, you know, where you wouldn't be able to see it uh, visually. Um, so really, uh, for that inspection, it really has to be a, a, a very large crack at that point to, to really be able to detect that. Good. Thank you very much. Vice Chairman. You mentioned the probability of detection um, using um, the visual detection techniques. That would depend, I guess, on the visual acuity of the inspector uh, to a certain extent and uh, the diligence of the inspector, the condition of the inspector, et cetera, um, human factors, if you will. Could you make a distinction between the probability of detection in percentages between, uh, say, the, the visual detection versus uh, ultrasonic and eddy current, since I think that's where we are now moving to, if I understand correctly? I don't think we have any specific numbers on that, but um, certainly uh, the, the ultrasonic inspection um, will allow for better detection for that uh, on-wing inspection, um, and especially for any cracks that are initiating underneath that uh, dovetail coating that are going to be completely invisible to, to the visual inspection, um, that uh, ultrasonic inspection should detect those. Um, and then the eddy current inspection that's been implemented during the overhaul process, um, that's also a, a, an even more sensitive technique potentially to, to find these cracks. So just better we don't have any qualitative uh, description of that. Um, I, those numbers have been run, you know, just to you know, that to determine the inspection intervals, you kind of need to know your probabilities and, and set up your, you know, what's your probability of detection and, you know, what's your confidence in being able to have multiple opportunities to detect those cracks. And so so, so following up on the, the chairman's question here of, you know, this, this particular blade had a crack present and it went through seven inspections prior and nobody caught it. How much confidence do we have that the new inspection protocol uh, is going to uh, be significantly better? We're, we're very confident. Okay. Perhaps at a, at a very high level you could describe, because I think we've been sort of hitting all around it, but if you could describe how the um, fan blade testing protocol has changed um, and also the inspection protocols since these two uh, events. As far as the inspection is concerned, prior to the uh, Pensacola event, um, FPI and visual at overhaul and on wing was merely a visual. But since then, uh, for overhaul, we still keep with the visual, we still keep with the FPI, now we added the, the ECI. 
And for the field inspections, uh, you still do the visual, but now you have the uh, UT as well. Okay, and uh, over what period of, of cycles? Because I think we've, we've suddenly recognized that uh, the initial uh, inspection period was perhaps a bit optimistic. So CFM has issued several um, different service bulletins for the initial and repetitive inspections. Um, the intent was to go after the high cycle blades first, and as those got inspected, the service bulletins um, got modified to go to lower and lower inspection um, time or cycles for each of the blades. So um, essentially, the, the way the service bulletins are written and the ADs are required required is that the um, you first have to go through the first inspection, the initial inspection. And right now, I think uh, anything that has uh, greater than 17,000 cycles needs to be inspected. So the repetitive part does not necessarily kick in. Uh, like I presented, Southwest has taken the proactive step in saying, we're not going to wait for that initial. We're just going to do the repetitive inspection at every opportunity. How often is that? Uh, every 1,600 cycles. So. We have a and high that level. And that matches the, the relube interval. So the blades have to be removed to do the relube, and they're taking that opportunity to do the uh, fan blade inspection. And we have, quote, high confidence that that will catch uh, any incipient cracks. Yes, we do. And, and the fact that they're doing it every 1,600 hours, uh, we have even greater confidence because we know that based on the crack propagation rates that they're going to have multiple opportunities. Even if they do miss one, they'll have more opportunities to, in, to uh, detect the crack. Okay. Got it, thank you. Thank you very much. Member Hamadi. Uh What about other engines and other aircraft? I mean, should they be doing, I assume blades are also subject to fatigue, cracking in other engines. I mean, I know we're focused on this one and the industry is focused on this one. I'm just curious. Um, e each blade and each engine manufacturer has their unique uh, inspection requirements. So for this one, we have a, a, a solid blade, a metallic blade, so certain inspections are very appropriate for it. Um, you have other engine models that are using composite blades, so the inspections that you would mandate or you would recommend for this particular uh, model would not necessarily be appropriate for those others. And um, you mentioned composite blades. So fan blade materials over time have changed. That and, is correct. you know, uh, now they're going more towards carbon fiber. It's lighter, it breaks up. Um, what would necessitate uh, retesting under federal regulations for, say, new materials used? So as far as the composite blades, when they started coming into service, the FAA had issued a special, um, a special condition to handle that. It was a new technology um, that hadn't been, hadn't been used in that particular application. So they knew that because of this new technology that certain things needed to be uh, part of the, the design process, part of the certification process, and part of the continuing airworthiness of, of that particular part. Okay, so, but then what does that require if you have an engine in service now and you have different... If it, if it was determined that it was a, uh, a safety of flight issue that uh, they could not handle during an inspection uh, and a redesign was required, then I would imagine at some level there would be either some uh, another uh, sort of test or analysis of that new, new design. But then the question is, is it really a redesign? Um, yes, it would be considered a redesign. It would be a brand new part, new part number. So, um, would it require a, a, a test on its own? It, it may not be. That would be something okay. that the the FA and the engine manufacturer would have to discuss. And did we? And I, I noticed in um, uh, Collins uh, submitted a uh, party submission that they found evidence of zinc in several locations on the fracture surfaces of the inner barrel. And um, 
that really um, the only places zinc could be is on the attach ring, which stayed um, attached to the fan case or on the blade platform. So did we look at that at all? I'm assuming we didn't have a blade platform, right? Most of the blade pat platform departed. Okay. We had so a we couple did, small pieces. So we weren't able to look at that at all? Um, no. Okay. Um, and I want to, what time is it? Okay, I want to switch to the window structure itself. Can you, t um, I don't know that I have enough time. Uh, you know what, I'll wait till the next, I'll wait till the next round. Okay, thank you, um, Member Homedy. Captain France, um, I want to talk about the, the performance of the flight crew. And um, so talk about what they, how they performed. Their performance, uh, as outlined in their report, um, they seem to accomplish all necessary uh, items, although, as, as we noted in the report, the checklists were not all executed per the, uh, the SOP per the, or per the instructions in the, in the actual checklist, but uh, essential items uh, were accomplished. The uh, crew seemed to be able to handle what was looks, according to FDR data, of, a difficult airplane to fly of some significant forces were required on the flight controls to, to keep the airplane um, straight and level or, or in the required descent, and that seemed to be handled um, appropriately as well. Yeah, I mean, the reason I ask that is that, yes, I've read the report several times, but uh, people in the audience don't necessarily know what's written in the report. Um, so what is the, uh, do you know what the time of useful consciousness is for an explosive decompression at, uh, at say, 32,000 feet? Uh, off the top of my head, I do not. Well, according to uh, FAA guidance material, it's uh, somewhere between uh, about 15 and 30 seconds. So uh, the def definition of the time of useful consciousness is the time that you would uh, be able to uh, take an appropriate action to, uh, is that basically correct? It's not really how long you will stay conscious is the time that you would be able to put on your mask and do do things like that. Is that about right? I, I believe that's correct. I believe the, the operative word is useful consciousness. Yeah. Yes. So they didn't have a whole lot of time to, uh, to put on their mask. They did put on their mask uh, quickly. They started down, started the descent. Uh, as you mentioned, they didn't, uh, the captain elected to, to um, uh, once she realized the severity of the, of the, uh, the injury in the back, she made the decision to, originally she called for a, about a 20 to 25 mile final. Uh, once she realized that uh, someone was uh, out the window, she uh, said, let's get it on the ground, basically. And uh, they didn't have time to do all the checklists, but um, she elected to land flaps five. What was her reasoning for that? In her interview, she described uh, controllability issues. Uh, the plane was not handling anywhere near, I believe, what she was expecting or what, what um, in regards to the type of force that she'd experienced in, the, in her simulator training. So she was worried about getting too slow, which would be required if there was a, a higher flap setting. She didn't want to get too slow because of her concerns about controllability. Yeah, so as I recall, the uh, she elected to land with flaps five. The... Uh, typical landing, landing flap setting for an engine out would be uh, flaps 15. She made that decision. Basically, she used airmanship. She used judgment because she felt that that was the safest thing to do. And as I recall, regulation 91.3 gives the pilot in command the authority to deviate uh, in the event of, of an emergency to do what he or she deems necessary. And uh, I'm not one to ever advocate skipping checklists. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm one to oftentimes point out the importance of, of skipping checklists. Uh, but in a situation like this, uh, frankly, the most important thing to do is to get the airplane on the ground. Keep the blue side up, get the landing gear down, put it on the concrete. And they did that. And uh, in, in their crew interviews, they each commented, they kept going back to the number one thing uh, in their 
uh, little mantra that they have on the front, front of, their, um, of their QRH. The four things you want to do, maintain aircraft control, analyze the problem, take appropriate action, and maintain situational awareness. And they both said they, they, that they kept going back to that number one thing, maintain aircraft control. And this agency has seen a number of accidents that, that, that something has happened or perceived to have happened where the flight crew did not maintain aircraft control. What this crew did do is they got it on the ground safely. And that's why we need a well-trained, well-experienced flight crew flying our airliner cockpits these days. That's what we need. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will uh, echo uh, his comments regarding uh, uh, the flexibility of the FAR is to let the pilot in command make whatever decision is needed to, to get down and, and maintain control. Is there any um, consideration for uh, changing possibly the checklists that were involved in this, uh, particularly given uh, the circumstances here, the aircraft did not perform quite the way I think anybody had expected it to, and I realize this is an odd event, but is this something that uh, will be uh, brought up in training? And a follow-on to that is, uh, uh, will simulators, uh, will there be some modification made to the simulation aspects? Regarding the checklist, um, the, the investigation didn't look into any potential needs for checklist modifications. Both crew members stated um, in their interviews that they felt like the checklists were adequate and they felt like their training had been good as well. In regarding, uh, in regards to your question about simulators, there was no question that we looked at in the investigation as to the adequacy of simulators to provide the kind of training. There was a brief, um, a brief look at uh, the value of perhaps training complex or compound emergencies, more than one serious emergency or event occurring uh, initially right after another. And um, that is not the way training typically goes. Typically in, in training, there's one primary emergency followed by perhaps one or two other minor follow-ons, but not two major emergencies as we saw in this situation, the loss of the engine and the rapid depressurization. So. Um, that issue was not examined in the report as far as is, is there a need to continue or develop to develop uh, more complex or, or compound training, compound emergency training. Yeah, I've uh, been in the receiving end of, of that in, in simulation, and it's, it's one of the mantras of the training facilities not to overburden the pilot because you can break anybody. But I think here there's an opportunity to say, you know, one thing, led to another, and yes, it was a compound major event. And so it seems to me that um, we keep learning about things that we're quite sure will never happen, and then somehow they do, and it would seem like that would be a good place to at least spend a little bit of time um, uh, working on that. So um, I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you, Vice Chairman and Member Homedy. Uh, I want to talk about the window structure for a second. Uh, a piece of the inboard fan cowl and the aft latch keeper impacted the fuselage, which caused the window to, to depart. Um, can you describe the window structure itself? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. The window, uh, the, window, the window itself, as you see in the airplane, is actually this three clear panels that, that are um, obvious to the, the passenger. One's called the, the outer and the, the middle pane are, um, they are structural in a manner. They're designed to keep pressure inside the airplane. So they have some, some beef to them, but they're held into a frame with some clips. And then there's an inner panel, um, sometimes called the scratch pane. It's just cosmetic. So the thing that you can actually touch when you're sitting in the, the passenger seat um, doesn't have any real structural robustness to it at all. Um, but the window itself is primarily designed simply to keep pressure inside the airplane. It is not designed to withstand any kind of impact uh, damage at all. Which was my next question. And so uh, this accident was the first known complete loss of uh, a, a window loss event for the Boeing 737 aircraft, correct? Um, 
What other window fracture or loss events have occurred? I don't know of any other full window loss events. Yeah, on the 737. Um, not for the 737, yeah. just in general. That's okay. It's mentioned in the report. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's yeah, it's very, it's very small, whatever it is. And the Actually, we have, according to Boeing, as of August 29, 2019, there were 33 outer plane fracture events in the 737 fleet and 16 such events in the 757 fleet. Well, just, in yeah. all of these cases, the middle plane carried the applied pressure load. There were about eight other complete passenger window loss events that occurred on airplanes and other uh, company fleets. And then we mentioned... Uh, some others as well. And so my question is, um, and, and I also read this in one of the party submissions, um, a recommendation for further analysis con concerning departure of the window and whether that should be looked at. Obviously, it's, it's not something that uh, uh, you mentioned that it's designed to keep pressure and not designed for impact. Do you think that should be looked at? Correct. Well, we didn't recover any of the window in order to analyze. There was no fragments of the window inside the airplane. They all, all departed and you know, were, were not found out in the countryside. Um, we don't, so we don't have any way of knowing if the window itself was actually impacted or not. Um, it may have been, or the, the way the, the mechanism, the latch mechanism, mechanism struck, may have skipped over the window. So there's, there's not much to analyze there as far as it came out. Uh, we do know the latch mechanism struck the fuselage, which the side of the fuselage structure is also not designed for impact. Things don't come at an airplane from the side. Mm -hmm. Some windows are. Um, if you think about a 747, it has some angled windows in the front, have some analysis and structure there for bird strike, that sort of thing. But the side facing, um, the mechanism that it came out, it's not designed to do that anyway. So what, what mechanism exactly caused the window to come out um, it's not designed to do that anyway, and without the window, there would be hardly there would be no re real way to it know that. It did not come out for the Pensacola flight, though, right? The Pensacola uh, impact was at a different location, uh, below the window belt and, and in some skin. It did make a very large hole in the skin uh, for the same reason. Again, that skin is not intended to be impacted by uh, dense objects. Okay, um, I have some questions on flight, uh, the f uh, performance of the flight attendants, but I'm going to first ask one question regarding um, medical response. It seemed when I listened to the CVR that it took quite a bit of time for um, fire personnel to get on board the aircraft. And when I looked at 11:17 at during the flight, uh, medical uh, assistance was requested. They landed at about 11.22 and 21. Um, at 11.22, the captain reminded uh, fire personnel about the injury on the aircraft. There were several times where this occurred, maybe three or four times, uh, over the course of about nine, nine, ten minutes. Did that seem an, an unusual amount of time? Did they, there seemed to be some confusion between fire and an injury on board. I don't know who wants to answer that. Yeah, I'll take that. I, I, I recall that they, uh, they eventually uh, had the flight attendants disarm. I believe it was the one R door, open the door, and they put a ladder up to it, and then firefighters entered the aircraft through. Yeah, preceding um, that, though. Preceding that, I'd have to go back and check but I do know that the fire personnel were aware that the, the aircraft was coming in and were ready for its arrival. Um, beyond that, I can't comment right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Member Hamidi. Mr. Fedok, um, this picture here, I think was on the, probably the front page of the USA Today. Uh, we see passengers that are not wearing their, their mask properly. Um, it, you can't see many faces here, but of the three faces that you can see, um, none of which none of which are wearing the mask properly. Um, did the report uh, look into any of that? Well, there are, there are three opportunities for flight attendant, or excuse me, for passengers to learn and, and understand how to use that piece of safety equipment. The first is in the, uh, the safety information um, card that's presented to them at their seat pocket. 
Every flight that uh, piece of uh, equipment is demonstrated either in person by a flight attendant or via video monitor. And the third way is actually when the masks do drop, you'll notice in those pictures, there is actually a caricature on the, the bag itself showing how to properly wear that piece of equipment. Yes, but uh, in spite of all three of those, uh, we have evidence that at least three people did not put it on. And uh, I didn't see that mentioned in the report. Is there any, any particular reason why? I don't know the reason why it's not in the report. I think it is documented in the, the factual report uh, as far as uh, the system itself. But passenger usage, again, um, we've made a number of recommendations on passenger education in the past, not particularly with the oxygen systems. Um, but it's, it's very difficult, unfortunately, to, to get passengers to um, pay attention to the safety briefings. And we see that repeatedly. Also, uh, in going through the docket material, I noticed that, um, that uh, some of the tubing from the PSUs for connecting the oxygen mask to the ceiling, to the passenger service uh, unit, uh, some of them were not properly uh, attached. In fact, some had come completely undone. Any thoughts on that? I didn't see reference to that in the, in the report. Right. When we documented the cabin, again, 24 to 36 hours after the event, we noted I think there were between 13 and 15 tubes that were disconnected from the manifold. Um, but you need to remember that the entire airplane was deplaned with passengers retrieving baggage um, and fire personnel going on board. So the, there's a significant snag risk there. We did have reports from one flight attendant and at least one passenger that there were some tubes that uh, disconnected from the manifold. Uh, one passenger helped another passenger by uh, reinserting it. And again, the passengers, uh, the flight attendants went through the cabin and ensured all the passengers were receiving oxygen uh, because there are additional masks at every manifold and at every row of seats. Well, thank you. I, I talked about the performance of the flight crew and as far as the flight attendants, um, you know, they, they were dealing with a horrific situation, one that they are trained for but you would never expect to see it um, or experience it. Uh, in one case, the A flight attendant was uh, going through the cabin and when she noticed that people were having difficulty with their mask, she then took her own mask and allowed those people to breathe from her own mask while she reattached the, uh, uh, their, their, their mask or their tubing. So I think that they, they were dealing with a a situation where they had seen something and experienced something that no one would ever really expect to ever go through. Um, I think under the circumstances, they did, uh, in my opinion, um, a nice job. As you mentioned, they, they did not make it back to their jump seats in time for landing, um, but, um, but I think they tried their best to, to act professionally and, uh, and, and take care of the passengers to the best that they could. So uh, I have uh, no more questions at this point. Member Hamadi. Yeah, I, I, I want to echo what the chairman said. I do think the flight attendants um, faced a situation that they never thought they would be in. Um, certainly you train for it, but um, you can certainly hear in their voices, the portions on the cockpit voice recorder, how chaotic it was and likely panicked everyone was. And in fact, they state in their interviews to investigators how many times that they had to uh, calm other passengers down. I imagine that would be in any similar scenario. So I, I, I do want to have you walk through, uh, Mr. Fedduck, um, what the flight attendants were doing at the time. Um, do you want to start? At the time of the depressurization? Yeah. We had, uh, they were just beginning uh, their service. So they were up in the cabin, one was in the lavatory, one was putting her apron on, getting ready for service. And so flight attendant A, she was the one um, uh, who, uh, had come out of the laboratory. She realized what was going on. She sat down in her jump seat. Flight attendant C also sat, sat down in the jump seat. They had their masks on. B was in the aft galley. Uh, at some point, the Southwest employee who was in the jump seat got her attention, and she sat down in the jump seat and put her mask on. And at some point, they all get their portable 
uh, oxygen masks and they start going through the cabin. A starts down, C passes her, from what I can tell from the, the, the interviews. B is coming from the back. They're, look, they're making sure people have their seatbelts on. They st state there's, they say uh, smoke is probably fog, and um, debris flying, it's loud. And uh, they're going down the aisle and they're checking seatbelts. They're making sure people have their masks on. There's tubing that came out, so they're trying to put that back in. They're helping uh, at least one mother and lap child. And at some point, A comes across C, who is flight attendant C, who is helping the passenger uh, in row 14. And along with C, she, A starts helping C address this, the serious situation going on in row 14. Two other passengers also join to help. And um, the, in, in, once they were able to get the passenger back in the plane, they, they had the entire row 14, and so they took the two passengers in row 14 and put them in another location in the aft galley. So the two passengers go to the aft galley, and there's a, a Southwest employee who's jump, who jump seated, who's in one jump seat, and so there, in this dual jump seat, there's a second jump seat that's available. So the flight attendant puts one, uh, one person from row 14 in that jump seat and another person on the floor uh, and because the plane is full. And so my question is, you know, we, we talk in the, the report about how um, A was on the floor, C was on the floor during landing, a lot was happening. They, they did not hear other than, you know, we're landing at Philly, which occurred around 11.05. They landed at 11.21, so 15 minutes went by. They did have 19 seconds where they realized that they were about to land, so they were yelling for people, heads down, brace, commands. My question is, you know, we say in the report that, all, that the flight attendants should have all been in their jump seat. What was B supposed to do? Because... Somebody in row 14 was placed in the seat. Right. And as you point out, the, um, there's a, recommend, a proposed recommendation in the report to provide additional guidance from the FAA to carriers about what to do to reseat occupants when you have an in-flight loss of seating capacity. And there are other reasons you may have that on a flight. And the fact that there's not guidance out there left the flight attendants a little bit high and dry as far as what do I do here. The, and I concur with the chairman's response that I think for the most part, they handled this emergency per their training and per their procedures. However, at the end of this, they needed to be in their jump seats because they needed to be prepared to evacuate an aircraft that had already had significant damage to it and they were unaware of what other potential damage might be to it. And having an accident at landing, those flight attendants needed to be secure and safe so that they could potentially evacuate that aircraft. So what to do with the passenger? If you have a spare capacity on a flight attendant jump seat, in this case, the forward flight attendant jump seat was unoccupied, you could have put a, the passenger up there. Again, we're looking for additional guidance from the FAA, what to do if there is no seating capacity. And, and I do think the uh, additional guidance is necessary because the man, manual, the flight attendant's manual didn't address this situation. And, um, you know, there was some question on what to do. Um, but in, and, but in this situation, I, I do think the FAA has to consider what happens if there is no uh, no seating available because I think I think it'd be I think it would be difficult for a flight attendant to come back later and say, okay, now you have to sit on the floor. I think I don't see that happening. Right. I, I just I, although the flight attendant's job is to be able to evacuate the aircraft after you know in the event of an ac accident. Um, I just uh, I just feel like that probably wasn't something that was going to happen where a flight attendant comes along and says, okay, now you got to get out of the seat that I put you in and sit on the floor so I can I can sit there. So hopefully the FAA can uh, sort that out with some guidance. Thanks. We have no more questions from the board. We'll take a break. We'll come back at uh, 11. 20, we are in recess. 
We are back in session, and uh, do, do either of my colleagues have additional questions? Thank you very much. Ms. Bryson, if you'd please read the proposed findings. Yes, sir. As a result of this investigation, staff proposes 13 findings. Number one, none of the following were factors in this accident. One, flight crew qualifications, which were in, which were in accordance with US regulations. Number two, flight crew medical conditions. Number three, the airworthiness of the airplane before the left engine failure occurred. And number four, Southwest Airlines maintenance of the airplane. Number two, the low cycle fatigue crack in the fan blade dovetail initiated because of higher than expected dovetail stresses under normal operating loads. And this crack was most, was most likely not detectable during the fluorescent penetrant inspection at the time of the fan blade set's last overhaul and subsequent visual inspections at the time of fan blade relubrications. Number three, the, the requirement for, to perform an eddy current inspection at the time of fan blade overhaul and an ultrasonic inspection at the time of blade relubrication should enable cracked fan blades in CFM 56-7B engines to be detected and removed from service before the cracks reach a critical size and the blades fracture. Number four, the fan blade fragments that traveled forward of the fan case, along with the displacement wave created by the fan blade's impact with the fan case, caused damage that compromised the structural integri integrity of the inlet and caused portions of the inlet to depart from the airplane. Number five, portions of the fan cowl departed the airplane because, number one, the impact of the separated fan blade with the fan case imparted significant loads into the fan cowl through the radial restraint fitting. And number two, the associated stresses in the fan cowl structure exceeded the residual strength of the fan cowl, causing its failure. Finding number six, the impact of the inboard fan cowl aft latch keeper with the fuselage near the cabin window adjacent to seat 14A caused the window to depart the airplane, the rapid depressurization of the cabin, and the passenger fatality. Number seven, the accident demonstrated the susceptibility of the fan cowl installed on Boeing 737 next generation series airplanes to a fan blade out impact location near the radial restraint fitting and the effects of such an impact on the structural integrity of the fan cow. Number eight, given the results of CFM's engine fan blade out or FBO containment certification tests and Boeing's subsequent structural analyses of the effects of an FBO event on the airframe, the post-FBO events that occurred during this accident could not have been predicted. Number nine, the structural analysis modeling tools that currently exist to analyze a fan blade out event and predict the subsequent engine and airframe damage will allow, the air, will allow airplane manufacturers to better understand the interaction of the engine and airframe during an FBO event and the response of the inlet fan cow and associated structures in the airplane's normal operating envelope. Number 10, performing required checklists according to standard operating procedures is a critical part of safe flight operations. However, given the emergency situation aboard this flight, the flight crew's performance of most but not all of the items on the engine fire or engine severe damage or separation non-normal checklist, and the non-performance of the three other relevant non-normal checklists allowed the crew to appropriately balance the procedural requirement of executing checklists with a high workload associated with maintaining airplane control and accomplishing a safe and timely descent and landing. Number 11, the flight crew's decision to land at Philadelphia International Airport was appropriate given the airplane's location 
at the time of the emergency, the circumstances of the emergency, and the airport's multiple runways and aircraft rescue and firefighting capabilities. Number 12, although not a factor in the outcome of this accident, the flight attendants should have been properly restrained in their assigned jump seats in case an emergency evacuation after landing was necessary. Number 13, Federal Aviation Administration guidance addressing options for reseating passengers if an in-flight loss of seating capacity were to occur would help air carriers implement procedures to address the situation. Thank you very much for reading those. Uh, are there any uh, proposed amendments? Great. Uh, do I have a motion to adopt the findings as read? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. All, uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the findings as proposed, please signal with a hand and say aye. Opposed, there are none. The findings have been adopted unanimously. Now, Ms. Bryson, if you'll please, please read the proposed probable cause. Staff proposes the following probable cause. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident was the in-flight separation of fan cowl components, including the inboard fan cowl aft latch keeper, which impacted the fuselage near a cabin window and caused the window to depart from the airplane, the cabin to rapidly depressurize, and the passenger fatality. The fan cowl components separated from the airplane because a fan blade, which had fractured due to a fatigue crack, impacted the engine fan case at a location that was critical to the structural integrity and performance of the fan cow structure. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's an amendment. Uh, do any of my colleagues have an amendment? I know I do. Okay, I'd like to propose an amendment. This has been passed out and handed out, and then I have made a pen and ink correction to some of your copies. I'll read it as I'm proposing it. So my motion is to amend the probable cause to read as follows. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident was a low cycle fatigue crack in the dovetail of fan blade number 13, which resulted in the fan blade separating in flight and impacting the engine case at a location that was critical to the structural integrity and performance of the fan cowl structure. This impact led to the in-flight separation of fan cowl components, including the inboard fan cowl aft, aft latch keeper, which struck the fuselage near a cabin window and caused the window to depart from the airplane, the cabin to rapidly depressurize, and the passenger fatality. That is my motion. Do I have a second? Okay, we have two seconds, so, uh, but thank you. We have, uh, we have a second. We, uh, it's been seconded, it's been moved and seconded. Um, as far as discussion, yes, I'm offering this amendment because I believe that the initiating event is in fact the low, low cycle fatigue crack which resulted in the fan blade separating. Um, the way that it is currently drafted um, by staff is that it says that the cause of the accident was the in-flight separation of the fan, fan cowl components. Uh, it's not until later that it talks about the fatigue crack. So that's, uh, that's my motion. Um, any further discussion? Staff, I'd sure love to hear your point. So uh, thanks for handing out ahead of time. We reviewed it and staff has no objection. Wow, I didn't expect that. But, uh, but, but thank you. Okay, uh, no, no further uh, questions or comments. All in favor of, of, uh, of approving the motion to, excuse me, all in favor of adopting the probable cause as amended, please signal with a hand and say aye. Opposed, there are none. The probable cause has been passed as amended. Now, Ms. Bryson, if you'll please read the proposed recommendations. As a result of this investigation, staff proposes seven new safety recommendations. Five of those recommendations are to the Federal Aviation Administration. 
Number one, require Boeing to determine the critical fan blade impact location or locations on the CFM 56-7B engine fan case and redesign the fan cowl structure on all Boeing 737 next generation series airplanes to ensure the structural integrity of the fan cowl after a fan blade out event. Number two, once the actions requested in safety recommendation number one are completed, require Boeing to install the redesigned fan cowl structure on new production 737 next generation series airplanes. Number three, once the actions requested in safety recommendation number one are completed, require operators of Boeing 737 next generation series airplanes to re retrofit their airplanes with the redesigned fan cowl structure. Number four, expand title, the Title 14 Code of Federal, regulation, Federal Regulations Part 25 and 33 certification requirements to mandate that airplane and engine manufacturers work collaboratively to, number one, analyze all critical fan blade impact locations for all engine operating conditions the resulting fan blade fragmentation and the effects of the fan blade out generated loads on the nacelle structure. And number two, develop a method to ensure that the analysis findings are fully accounted for in the design of the nacelle structure and its components. Number five, develop and issue guidance on ways that air carriers can mitigate hazards to passengers affected by an in-flight loss of seating capacity. One recommendation to Southwest Airlines, that is recommendation number six, include the lessons learned from the accident involving Southwest Airlines Flight 1380 in initial and recurrent flight attendant training, emphasizing the importance of being secured in a jump seat during emergency landings. And one recommendation to the European Aviation Safety Agency, recommendation number seven, expand your certification requirements for transport category airplanes and aircraft engines to mandate that airplane and engine manufacturers work collaboratively to number one, analyze all critical fan blade impact locations for all engine operating conditions, the resulting fan blade fragmentation, and the effects of the fan blade out generated loads on the nacelle structure. And number two, develop a method to ensure that the analysis findings are fully accounted for in the design of the nacelle structure and its components. Thank you, Ms. Bryson. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations as presented? So moved. It's been moved by the vice chairman, seconded by member Hamidi. Any discussion? There's none. All in favor of adopting the recommendations as presented, please signal with a hand and say aye. Opposed, there are none. The recommendations have been approved unanimously. Um, do either of my colleagues have any, uh, any additional issues for discussion? Is there a motion to adopt the report as revised? Member Hamadi has moved. The vice Chairman has seconded. Uh, all in favor of adopting the report as revised, please signal with a hand and say aye. Uh, uh, so um, let's do that. Did, did we get unanimous? I was not watching the screen there. All in favor of uh, adopting the report as revised, signal with a hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed, there are none. So the report has been adopted unanimously. Sorry, I was not. Uh, looking where I was supposed to be looking on that. Uh, do either of my colleagues wish the right to file a, a concurring or dissenting statement? Further discussion? No. Well, in closing, I do want to, I do want to thank the staff for your hard work, and I really want to thank my colleagues for all the hard work preparation that you've done going into this and for the good uh, the good questions, the good discussion, the good debate. Uh, my special thanks to Bill English. Bill, you served as the investigator in charge. Thank you for that. But I also realize that uh, it's not you alone. It's, a, it's an entire team that supports you, all the specialists coming together to create a, 
to complete an investigation that's very comprehensive. I also uh, recognize that it's not just the investigative staff that does things around here. It's, uh, it, it's, it's everyone. Um, we couldn't do what we do without the, without the support and the, uh, the program offices that do, do uh, support us. So on behalf of the board, a very sincere thank you, not only to the investigative staff, but to the program and support staff as well. The recommendations as we've adopted today are a reminder that it is not enough to, our, to do, it's not enough to just prevent the failure. We must also actively work to identify ways to minimize the effects of a failure if one does occur. These recommendations show the way forward for greater safety, even when a fan blade out event occurs. The best case is for every FBO to be prevented. But if one does occur, everything possible should be done to mitigate the consequences of the failure. Today, we recommended that engine and aircraft manufacturers develop more robust designs of the nacelle structures and its components that account for the critical F FBO impact locations. That translates to a better chance that damage to the aircraft and will be, minimi will be minimized during an FBO event, improving the safety of the flying public. We have a saying at the NTSB that from tr tragedy we draw knowledge to improve the safety for, of a, for us all. And that is why we're here today we are to take something very tragic, very unfortunate, and try to learn from it so that others don't have to go through this. We stand adjourned. The next board meeting will begin at 1.30 in this room. Thank you very much.